also those working with our kids. They especially need it. We're going in our Bibles today to the book of Psalm, chapter number 46. I don't know about you, but I, I think fall is probably is probably my favorite season. Uh, somewhere maybe between spring and fall. I don't love winter. Too cold. I don't love summer. Too hot. You know, you can only take so many clothes off uh, before, uh, before you're going to get arrested for that. Uh, there's a lot to love about fall. How many know that's true? S'mores. In the fall, anybody love s'mores? Pumpkin patches, pumpkin carving, pumpkin spice, pumpkin everything. All the pumpkin, right? The temperature, of course. I like fall temperatures. But there are some things about fall that I don't like. If you find your way to Psalm chapter 46, candy corn. I mean, candy corn, that is the devil's candy, I think, isn't it? I mean, if... Everybody's welcome at Freedom Church, but if you like candy corn, I'm going to have to really pray about that. I just don't know if uh, you are welcome at Freedom Church. Scary movies and haunted houses. You're never going to catch me in a haunted house. The devil is a liar. I don't want nothing to do with that. I don't even like the commercials in the fall. It scares me to death. The sun, of course, is setting earlier. Darkness more prevalent in both in nature and in culture. In fact, they call this season scary season, a season where fears are exploited and capitalized on, darkness and pain and frightening places, scary season. I don't like much about our culture's fascination with scary season, but I know this. The truth is we all will have scary seasons. They're not as predictable, unfortunately, as the annual calendar when we know the candy corn is coming out and the scary uh, commercials are going to be airing. We don't always know when they're coming, but here's what I believe and what I want to preach to you about over these next few weeks. I believe that we can survive every scary season. And so I want to preach to you in these next few weeks about surviving scary season. Psalm chapter number 46, beginning at verse number 1, then I'll... I'll have you be seated in just a moment. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the seas, though the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with swelling, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle, of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. I, I need that help. How about you? The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Behold, but, uh, come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth and breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot with fire. Be still, he says, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I want to preach to you about surviving scary Seasons and specifically today about surviving the seasons of darkness. Before you're seated, would you just pray with me one more time? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence that's here in this place today, for every person that has gathered, for the worship that has went forth. God, I pray that you would speak to us through your word. We know your word is truth, and your word brings life, and your word brings strength. I pray, God, that it would be all of those things in our lives today, and we thank you for it. And everyone said, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I, I remember, I don't know about you, maybe you were always very strong and tough and not afraid, but I remember as a kid being afraid of the dark. Anybody would be honest and say you were afraid of the dark at some point in your life. You don't have to 
it might still be now, but you at some point, you were afraid of the dark. I had an aunt grew, growing up in Kentucky. Uh, some of my family, they live all on, really like on the same hill. Uh, they call it Herman Hill. And uh, my aunt lived about 150 yards from my grandmother's house. And I remember as a kid, I would be spending time at my aunt's house. And uh, it was dark outside. It was time to go back to my grandmother's house. And you've never seen somebody run as fast as I would run when I would make it out of my aunt's door to my grandparents' porch in the darkness. I was like Lightning McQueen. But, you know, it's really not so much the darkness that, that we're afraid of. It's the things that we think may be in the dark. Lurking in the darkness. Reminds me of this story. This kid was, uh, uh, his mother said, uh, hey, I need you to go outside and, and get the broom. Uh, the boy said, well, mom, it's, it's already dark outside. I, I, I can't go outside right now. It's dark. She said, you don't have to worry about it. the darkness. Jesus is out there. You can go and get the broom. And so the boy goes to the front door and he opens it up wide and says, Jesus, if you're out there, bring in the broom. It's like, you know, there's just something about the darkness. Again, it's not the darkness. It's what you can't see in the dark. Scary seasons. Have you ever awakened, been awakened in the middle of the night and some harmless object in your room scares you? Like that dirty pile of laundry that you were supposed to take care of suddenly in the middle of the night looks like a serial killer. Who would be honest? And no, that's. But the truth is this. There are certain things that are in a dark place that when you know that they are there, you can navigate them. If you wake up in the middle of the night and the lights are off in your room, you know where the bed is, you know where the furniture is. You can get up and you can walk and you can navigate in the darkness. That when you are confident of the placement of things around you, you can move in the darkness because of what you know, because of what you are confident in, because of what you are persuaded about, you can move even when you can not see. And here's what I want to preach to you about today for just a few moments. I want you to understand that the enemy wants you and me to be paralyzed by fear. To be frozen in, in action. To be gripped by fear in scary seasons because of what we cannot see. Because of what we are unable to discern. You turn on the news and all you see is darkness. How many know that is the truth? You uh, Just yesterday uh, we were uh, 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 alarmed by the news of war in Israel and the things that are happening there. Paul would say it this way to Timothy, in the last days perilous times will come. Difficult times will come. And then he said, and evil will just get worse and worse. Evil, of course, is synonymous in Scripture with darkness. You can find the parallel between them over and over again. So he's not just saying it's going to get more evil. He's saying it's going to get darker and it's going to get darker. That there are things, that there are going to be scary seasons that are coming in our way. It is a scary season that we are living in. When, when sickness comes, that's a scary season. When the financial difficulty comes, it's a scary season. When the marital problems come, it is a scary season. And if we are not careful, when we see the darkness in life and culture and in our circumstances, we will be paralyzed in place and we will be gripped by fear. But Paul told Timothy in that moment in 2 Timothy, after he said it's going to get evil and more evil, darker and darker. He says when you see the darkness and evil and when you can't see anything other than darkness, he says this in 2 Timothy 3.14, but you continue in the things that you learn and became convinced of, knowing 
from whom you have learned them. So I want to preach to you today and tell you how we survived the scary season of darkness. And I tell you that we survived the season of darkness by holding on to the truth of God's Word and being convinced of it and being persuaded by it, knowing that while there are things up ahead that we cannot see, that there are also things that we know in this scary season. So because of what we know, we can step in confidence. This morning I was uh, awakened by a dream. The genesis of the sermon uh, today, in fact, I was awakened uh, just before six, having in, uh, in my dream, I was preaching in a church and I walked up to the pulpit and didn't have any notes. That's like, that's scary stuff right there. Okay, let me just tell you, like, don't know what you're going to preach, and it was a large room. It was uh, actually it was the uh, uh, the Pentecostals of Alexandria, a large church in our fellowship, and and uh, and I'm walking up to the pulpit, and I don't have any notes, and and so uh, I, I began to preach there without notes, without knowing what I was going to preach about being persuaded. And confident. I woke up and I thought, that's pretty good. I think that's what I'm going to preach about at Freedom Church today. It looks just like the Pentecostals of Alexandria. Hmm. We must be persuaded, confident, convinced about some things. If we are going to survive the scary season of darkness that we are facing in our lives. What must we be persuaded of? The first thing that we must be persuaded of is of God's word and God's truth. That God's word is truth. That what God's word says is true. His word is forever settled in heaven. That heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle of God's word will pass away. You will never make it through the scary seasons of life without a confidence and without being persuaded by God's word. I am persuaded that God's word is truth. The Bible tells us of this rich man. Jesus uh, tells in uh, what some say is a parable and some would say that it's not of a rich man who dies and is in hell and he lifts up his eyes in torment and he sees Father Abraham and He begins to speak to Abraham in conversation and he asks Abraham a question. If either he or someone else from the dead could come to his family and could talk to them and warn them and persuade them of the truth. And Abraham just said, they they have the prophets. And if they won't believe the prophets, then they wouldn't believe you or me or someone else from the dead. And, And that strikes me because the truth of the matter is... Sometimes we think that things would be a little bit more convincing if it was a bit more supernatural in nature. That if I just heard a voice from heaven, then I would believe. Or if I just saw a sign in the skies, then I would believe. That if there was some kind of supernatural demonstration, then I would believe that what God's Word says is true. But the truth of the matter is, the purity of faith is simply being able to look at the Word of God and say, if I never see some supernatural sign of its truth, I still believe that God's Word is true. I don't have to have a sign. I've already got His Word. I don't need some kind of supernatural demonstration. I have 66 books of God's Word, and I believe that every one of those words is true, and it is settled in heaven. And if I will believe in the truth of God's Word, then I can survive in every scary season. I am persuaded that God's Word is true. I am persuaded that every promise in God's book is true. The Bible says that the crowd was persuaded to choose Barabbas over Jesus by just a few elders who who began to talk to them and try to convince them that they would be better off with a murderer than with a savior. And the truth of the matter is today, there are a lot of voices in this day that want to try to convince you that you'd be better off believing something other than the word of God, that you would be better off with things that would kill you instead of things that would save you. But I am persuaded that Jesus is the best way and that his word is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. I believe, I am persuaded that God's word 
is true. You're not going to convince me otherwise. You're not going to deceive me. There, there, uh, things may go on in my life, but, but I believe that, that God's word is still true. And that fundamental truth and, 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 and embracing that truth, it is key in order for us to be persuaded of the other things that we need in order to survive the scary seasons of darkness in our lives. Once we are convinced of God's word and are persuaded of the, the uh, inerrancy and infallibility of God's word, then and only then can we be persuaded of God's power. And we must be persuaded of God's power in order to survive scary seasons. The Bible says that when Paul was converted in the book of Acts, Paul previously saw a murderer and a persecutor of the church. When Paul was converted, that uh, almost right away, the scripture says that the Jews began conspiring to kill him. And in just a few verses after that, the Bible says that, that the church was still suspicious of him. They were not nearly as persuaded as the Jews were. They were not merely, uh, nearly as persuaded as the world was. And i got to tell you, I don't want it to be said of this church that the world is more persuaded of God's power than we are. That the world is more persuaded of God's ability than we are. But let it be said that if I'm going to survive every scary season, that I believe that God is a he that I believe that God is a way maker, that I believe that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. I am not skeptical of God's power or His ability, but I believe, I am persuaded that God is powerful, that He is able to do anything and all things well. I'm persuaded that God is able to heal. I'm persuaded that God can save anyone, that He can reach into any pit, that He can turn around any situation, that He can step into every family situation, that He can move in any city, that He can work in any place, that God has power. And if we're going to survive scary seasons, we must be convinced of His power. Paul would say it this way in 2 Timothy 1.12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded. Somebody say persuaded. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I am persuaded of God's word. I am persuaded of God's power. And then the third thing that we must be persuaded of is we must be persuaded of God's timing. Now I got to tell you now, that's a real tough one. I can believe that God is powerful. But if God doesn't show up on my time, then I have a little problem with Him. The thing about seasons, though, is that they change. And I've got to trust in God's timing to bring the season, the change of the season, in His time, in His way. The Bible says that His ways are untraceable. You can't trace Him. You can't track Him. But also, His timing is impeccable. And while I may not be able to trace Him, I can trust Him that, that His timing is perfect and it is better than mine. And while He may not come, as the old song said, when I want Him, He will always show up right on time. God is in control of the seasons. And so I will trust His timing. And I won't try to control His timing or force His timing. I will believe that time is in His hands. You've got to be persuaded of the timing of God. We can't force time to stop or slow down or to go faster. His timing. We, if we're going to survive the scary seasons, we must trust and be persuaded of His word, of His power, of His timing. And if we are going to survive the scary seasons of darkness in our lives, then we must be persuaded of God's love. Because you see, when the timing isn't what you think it ought to be, 
And when the darkness has things in it that you don't think should have been there, then you have got to rest in God's love and trust that God loves you enough that if He brought you to the season, then it is for a reason. And if He's brought me to this trial, it's for my good. And if He's allowing me to go through this circumstance, then He must have some good for it that God is in control. This is what it says in Romans 8.38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor death nor any other creature. He makes a big long list to make sure that he doesn't miss anything because he wants to say that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. God, I'm telling you today that even the darkness cannot separate you from God's love. Even the trials and the tribulations and the circumstances cannot keep God's love from you. God works in the darkness too. The scripture says He works the night shift in the Jerry West translation. And finally, we must be persuaded. Of God's promises. This is what it says about Abraham. In Romans chapter number 4 verse 21. And being fully persuaded. That what he had promised. He was able also to perform. You've got to believe and be persuaded of the promise of God. Because if you are not persuaded in his promise then the problems will persuade you. If you are not persuaded in His power, then your obstacle will persuade you. If you are not persuaded in His word, then the words of the enemy will persuade you. You've got to decide before the scary season starts that I'm going to make it through every season of darkness by being persuaded that God's promise will come to pass. I read a story uh, recently of of a lady named Florence Chadwick. Brother Mike makes his way to the music. She, Florence, was the first woman to swim the English Channel. And she decided in 1952 that she wanted to swim from Catalina Island to the California coast, uh, about 26 miles, which is about 25 and three quarters miles further than I'm going to try to swim it. And so she uh, decides that she's going to do this. No woman had ever done it before. And so she begins one day. Uh, it's very foggy out. She can't see nearly in front of her when she started to swim. And after 15 hours in the water, that's a long time, she looks up at her mother who's in the little boat beside her and says, Mom, I, I can't make it. I can't go any further. And so her mom tried to encourage her, but after swimming for another 55 minutes, she gave up and got in the boat. A couple minutes later, she discovered that she was only a half a mile from the coastline. Asked later why she quit, Chadwick said, it was because I couldn't see anything. She said, if I could have just seen the coastline, I know I would have made it. Florence's story doesn't end there. Two months later, she got back in the water. And not only did she swim from Catalina Island to California, but she beat the women's record for that distance and also the men's by two and a half hours. The second time she swam, it was even foggier than the first time. She said she could see nothing. But when reporters asked her about it afterwards, she says, I was ready this time, and it's real simple. I kept a picture in my mind of the shoreline. Even though I couldn't see it with my eyes, she says, it was before me. I never lost sight of the California shoreline, and so I felt like I was always closing in on it. And as long as I lived for the picture in my mind, I could keep slogging through the fog of my challenge. That 
is what I preach to you today to tell you that you can make it through every scary season. But you've got to be persuaded. You've got to see the finish line. You've got to see the promise of God. You've got to see the power of God. You've got to see the Word of God. You've got to keep those things in front of you. The Scripture says this about those heroes of faith. It says, had they been mindful of where they had come from, they could have turned back. But they declare plainly that they seek a better country, a heavenly one. And so I I tell you today that when you face those scary seasons, dark seasons, that you can't see in front of you, when you don't know which way to go and where to turn, when when you're really not sure what's up ahead, that you can make it through every scary season. A season... It's just a season. It'll change. So you've got to keep going. You've got to keep believing. You've got to be persuaded. He says this, I'm persuaded that he that has begun a good work in you will complete it. God is not done with you yet. Your season is not your ending. It's just something that you're going through, and the season will change. Stand with me all over the house. How do we survive the scary season of darkness? We must be persuaded of God's word. We must be persuaded of God's power. We must be persuaded of God's love. We must be persuaded of God's promise. We have got to be persuaded of God's timing. So you got to make up your mind. God's got this. I may not be able to see it, but God sees what I do not see. His ways are above my ways, and they are past finding out. I, I don't have to figure out what God is doing. I've just got to trust Him. I've got to be persuaded that He is in control. And so I preach to people today that are facing scary seasons. And it's not candy corn. It's trial, difficulty, circumstance. Not imaginary things. You know, the truth is that while you're not going to catch me going to one because I don't believe God is the author of fear and I don't want to be a partaker in it. I, I don't like being scared. But I know that if I go to a haunted house and I pay money to go to that haunted house, I could make it out of it. Otherwise, you know, they're not going to keep making money. But the truth is, some of the things that you're facing, you know they're not imaginary problems. They're real. They're not imaginary goblins. They're real. And if we are not careful, we will begin to believe that we can't survive the scary season. But I tell you that every season has a reason. And you can make it. You can do it. But you must hold on to God's word and his promises. You must trust his timing. And you must just believe that if you will just stay with him, you'll make it. Though the waters move and roar, the psalmist said, though wars are happening, though all of these things are going on, he said, God is our God. He is with us. He is for us. You've got to believe that God is with you. God is for you. God is working on your behalf. You need to just stand on that promise and walk out of here persuaded that I'm going to make it through this. This isn't going to be the end of my story. I can survive the scary season of darkness. Praise God. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I don't know where it is that you're fa- that you're immobilized. The moment that you have been in. The darkness that has consumed you. The weeping that the Bible says that endures for the night. Those things that are coming up against you. That scary season of darkness. But I know under the sound of my voice that there are people that 
that is the season that you're in. You feel the darkness. You, you sense those things lurking around. And your heart has been captured by fear. And I just come by the church today to tell you that you're going to make it. That you can do it. That Just hold on to His word and His promises and His timing. And just be persuaded that this is not going to be the end for you. And while the light may not come on and pierce your darkness today, there is a light that can be shining inside of you. That, that lamp that lights your path, the word of the Lord. The word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And you can hold on to his word today and say, hey, his word says I'm going to make it. His word says that he is for me. His word says that, 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 that the things that no weapon formed against me will prosper. And I'm going to hold on to his word. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We feel your presence here even right now. I know that there are people under the sound of my voice, God, that while I may not know what it is that brings the darkness in their life, that there are hearts that are gripped by darkness even right now, that there are fears and anxieties about the trials and the circumstances and the things that we are facing. And Lord, I pray that there would be a determination that would settle in every heart and in every life right now, that our minds would be fixed, that our hearts would be fixed, that our eyes would be fixed on you and on your word. God, we know that faith and, and fear are both fueled by focus and so we choose today to focus on your word and to focus on your truth and to be persuaded God that you are with us and that your promises are yes and amen and that no weapon formed against us will prosper we come against every lie of the enemy right now that would try to deceive and would try to discourage and would try to cause doubt and we declare the name of Jesus and the promise of God over every life and over every circumstance today. Hallelujah. I feel the presence of the Lord right now. I believe that the power of the Word of God, I say this nearly every week, but the power of the Word of God is connected to our ability and our willingness to respond to it. And so in your own way, I'm going to ask you to just respond to the word of the Lord. Maybe it's at your seat, or maybe you want to step out into the aisle, or even come around the front and say, I, I believe the word of the Lord, and, and I, I declare the word of the Lord today over my life, and over my darkness, and over my situation, and that I will survive the scary season of darkness that has come against me, that weeping may endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. And the morning when the sun comes up, it's not going to find me destroyed or cast down, but it's going to find me victorious and whole and with everything restored that was taken from me. Hallelujah. Come on, would you receive the promise of God in the house right now? As we sing just for a moment, would you say, Lord, I believe it's for me. I believe that the truth is for me. I, I believe that you are for me. I believe that you have all power in heaven and in earth. I believe that you have power over every sickness, that you have power over every disease, that you have power over every person and everything that would try to come against me and would try to stop me and would try to stop your promise for me. Hallelujah. Come on, you need to just grab hold of the promises of God for just a moment before we leave. God, you're a healer. God, you're a provider. God, you're a way maker. You're a protector. You're a defender. You are my shield and my buckler. You are my defense, God. God, you are with me. You've never left me. You've never forsaken me, but you will be with me to the very end. You are a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Come on, you got to hold on to the promise today. Hallelujah. Come on, the presence of the Lord is here right now. I, I feel faith beginning to rise. I fear, I feel joy beginning to be restored. I, I feel faith in the house right now. You're going to make it. You're, you're going to make it through this season of darkness. The light is going to shine again. God is going to get the glory in your life. 
praise. God, come on, why don't we clap our hands to the Lord and just thank God for his promise today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Our greatest weapon is our persuasion in God's word. Being persuaded, being convinced. When the enemy came against Jesus with this temptation, Jesus defeated the enemy with just a few words. It is written. Amen. He was persuaded about the word. I've got to be persuaded. And if I will be persuaded, then the enemy can bring his best. And I'm going to make it. Somebody say, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Amen. Praise God. Clap your hands one more time and just thank God for his goodness and his word. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. To all of our guests, thank you so much for joining us today. We were honored to have you here. We have a little challenge here at Freedom Church. We call it the Stick Six Challenge. We ask you to try us out six times. After six times, you're going to have a really good idea who we are. We're going to have a good idea who you are. And you can determine whether or not this is the house that you can best grow in your relationship with God. And if it's not, we are, we are connected to numerous churches. And we believe that we can help you find the church. But we believe that we are better together. That we need a faith community that we can grow together and fight together together and pray together and worship together and all of the other togethers. Amen. This week we have several small groups that are that are meeting across the DMV. Our Capitol Hill small group is this Thursday. Last Thursday I went to that small group and somebody hit my car, my brand new car that I just picked up four hours before. So I got to go back again uh, just so I can erase that memory. Uh, also, our Northwest D.C., uh, the small group that meets here every other Saturday, it's meeting this Saturday. Uh, our Northern Virginia small group is this Saturday. All kinds of small groups happening. And so if you're not connected to a small group, stop at uh, the table in the foyer and use your phone, scan your QR code, get connected to one of our small groups. We are a new and small church. Like, we are a small group that meets here. But we want to get bigger and smaller at the same time. And the way that we do that is by being connected to small groups and not by trying to offend people, which I hope I haven't done today. Okay. Finally, uh, for those of you who are faithful members here at Freedom, I want to encourage you and remind you about the ways that you can give to Freedom and your tithes and offering, three ways that you can give using the giving kiosk in the lobby online or texting any dollar amount to 84321. My wife did that last week, and apparently she gave to another church because uh, she's not, uh, you know, she had given to another church before that uses the same QR code. So uh, Parker told me uh, yesterday that he, uh, I forget what it was he said he's going to do, that he's going to make so many millions of dollars. It's always some idea. And he said, I'm going to pay at least a million dollars a year in tithes. He says, but I'm giving it to Calvary Tabernacle in Indianapolis. I'm like, you know what? Then you're going to move out of my house today. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being with us. If you are a guest, don't leave without getting a gift. We got a gift for you. Uh, uh, complete your QR code uh, with at least your name and your email address. And we want to make a $5 donation to one of our local nonprofits here in your name and honor. And you're going to get to pick that. Uh, which direction that's going to go. God bless you. Find somebody, give them a high five, tell them you're glad to see them today, and we'll see you back next week. Next week is Unity Sunday. We're going to be joining together with our friends, Nova Church, our sister church. And so you better get here early if you want a padded chair. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting in a folding chair because we're going to pack the place out next week. God bless you.